Well, you're glad you're in the air conditioning tonight. I'd say, I'd say winter's about gone. Oh, I'm speaking. See this stream of water coming down off my head? That's winter time is over. That's what that is, what that means. Yeah, it's gone. Well, praise the Lord. Did you bring a Bible tonight? All right, we're going to get into it here in a minute. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Appreciate everybody being here, and we'll have a prayer time here in a little bit. Um, <clears throat> I want to pray for uh, Sister Lola, and uh, she's in, uh, they call it TCU now. And I don't know if that's the permanent name. I guess that's transitional care unit, something. But anyway, uh, it's in the I, it's ICU, from what I could see. Um, they were going to do a cardiac cath on her yesterday, and she's just too sick. And um, so I went and had prayer with her, and she's very sad, wants to go home. And uh, it's kind of a situation, uh, she may never get to go home. Uh, so just pray for her, pray for Linda. It's hitting her pretty hard, and just lift them up. And then little Lawson, um, uh, Matthew and Paige's youngest, he's, they've had him at urgent care, and then they went up to uh, Cardinal Glennon, and then now they're gone to where? St. Louis Mercy. The old St. John's. The old St. John's, and... Um, so anyway, he's, he's sick, and they don't know exactly what's going on with him, so just pray for him, and uh, pray for Paige and Matthew. Pray for Lisa and I. We have Hunter. <sighs> so there's a reason why we get to a certain age, and we can't have babies anymore. We don't need them, okay? So anyway, uh, pray about that. But let's take our Bibles, turn to First Peter. And uh, we'll get into the word tonight, and then we'll have a prayer time. All right, First Peter chapter 3. Are you ready to go to the Lord in prayer tonight? Amen. Father in heaven, come before you tonight. And we thank you, Father, for this warm weather, that sun coming out. It's making all of our grass grow, and all of our trees leaf out, and our flowers grow, and our tomato plants are going in the ground, and all those things about springtime, Lord, that we love. And we thank you, Lord, for bringing us out of wintertime, bringing us out of the winter, Lord, of our lives. And pray, dear God, that with spring, uh, each and every one of us, Lord, could have a renewal of some kind or a revival of some kind in our lives. And Father, we just pray, dear God, that you would just uh, bless us and help us. Bless those, Lord, that are sick tonight, those that are struggling or hurting. Father, I pray, God, that sins would be forgiven, that People's lives would be changed. Lord, that through your word, and through the working of the Holy Spirit in people's lives, Lord, that they would find grace and comfort, areas of life, Lord, where they're needed. Father, we thank you, dear God, for all that we heard last week. We thank you, dear God, for the message that you imparted to us here. And Lord, then the message that was carried forth out of this place and we ask, God, that you would just continue to bless it, uh, even as those videos get posted, Lord, that you would just continue to resound the, the message all over the world, Father, uh, for your people to be well-armed and to be ready, Lord, to go to battle. And Father, we understand that our battle and our wrestling is not with the flesh and blood of this world, but with evil spirits. And I pray, dear God, that you would equip each one of us to know our weapons of warfare are not carnal and help us, dear God, to pull down strongholds and everything, Lord, that exalts itself above the knowledge of God. And Father, we pray, dear God, that the knowledge of God through the Word of God would be exalted tonight in each and every heart. Father, teach us some things, Lord, that we uh, need to know. Father, teach us some things, Lord, that will be the foundation of other things that we'll learn. And Lord, just help us and give us understanding in your word tonight. Bless those that are sick, uh, Lord, and bless the little babies, Lord, that, that are sick and hurting. 
Bless our older folk in this church, Lord, that are hurting this time. I pray, God, that you would just give them grace and help. And Father, we just, Lord, that we ask God that you would unite our hearts together, knit us together, Lord, as your body here in this place. Thank you for these that are gathered with us online. And we pray, Lord, that you would just bless them with a double blessing. Lord, that you'd visit with them, Lord, and they're not able to be here in this place. God, that you would satisfy their needs and help them in their journey of life. So, Father, we just ask that you just bless and honor your word tonight. Give us grace and comfort. Give us knowledge and understanding. And, Lord, Father, just teach us wisdom. We pray in Jesus' name and all of God's people said, Amen. First Peter chapter 3. Let me get there myself. Kind of get the background. I've got the verses that I want to start out with up on the screen, but I want to kind of back up a little bit. It's been a couple Wednesday nights. Uh, since uh, we were gathered together like this for a regular meeting last Wednesday night, of course, was our uh, Bible conference. And I think the Wednesday before that, Lisa and I were out of town preaching. But anyway, in 1 Peter, let me get there, chapter 3. Uh, we're going to key in on verse 18, but let's back up just a little bit and look at verse, let's pick it up in verse 14. And he's talking about the whole, the whole deal about 1 Peter is suffering. And going through a fiery trial. And it's meant to try your faith, not your works. Your works are either wood, hay, and stubble, or they're made of things that when the fire comes, that will not perish. But he's going to try our faith. So he says in verse 14, But and if ye suffer for righteousness sake, happy are ye. Be not afraid of their terror, neither be troubled. But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you of reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. I want you to ponder that word hope and the message of hope that we have. That when everything fails in this life and things go bad, we have a, a better life. I, I, was, I was deeply moved uh, visiting with Sister Lola the other day. She was... She was not well, and she had, had experienced a real bad episode uh, while she was in the hospital, and it troubled her. And she was crying, and she said, Brother Mike, she said, I don't like this. I don't like what I'm going through. Why, 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 why am I having to go through this? And I said, Sister Lola, everybody that's right with God and born again, this life, we're going to suffer. And the older that we get, the more that suffering becomes apparent. We don't like the condition that our body gets in with age. Things we can't do and things we have no control over anymore. And that's really what's, what was bothering her, what was troubling her. And uh, I said, Sister Lola, the hope that we have is that we have a life that's better on the other side of this one. And whatever trials we go through and whatever we have to suffer and whatever we have to face and whatever things we have to deal with for righteousness sake, it's just part of the flesh and the world that we live in. It's corrupt and it's getting worse all the time. And it just makes us want to be in heaven more and more every day. We can't, if, if we're satisfied with this life now, then our desire for the next life is greatly diminished. But the more we suffer in this life, the more precious heaven then becomes to us. And when Christ blows that trumpet, and calls our name, we jump up and say, I'm ready. I'm ready for it. So he said, that's the hope that we have. So he said, uh, verse 16, having a good conscience that whereas they speak evil of you as, as of evildoers, they may be ashamed that falsely accuse your good conversation in Christ. Now I'm going to say this, and I'm not going to, I, I don't want to hurt the man's feelings, but I got an email from one of our followers that did not like uh, the things that were preached in our conference last week. And um, I really think that they misunderstood 
what what it is that I was saying, what it is that I was standing for. Uh, may have misunderstood some things Reg preached or Chris taught. But I, I just kind of, I got an email from him and he didn't like our position. Didn't like what was said. And uh, in, in a way, there's a little bit of a false accusation. Uh, it was in his email. And I thought, boy, I'm really going to, I'm going to tear him up. And I'm going to write, and I just decided not to do that. And what I said was, I said what I said, and I preached what I said, and I meant what I said, and I stand by what I said. And the whole gist of last week is, is that those who have been given the right by God to defend those who cannot defend themselves, if we are equipped well enough, it is hoped that we would never have to use the weapons that we have to defend ourselves. Amen. The idea that a city is well shielded and well defended, that in itself is a defense against anybody who would try to harm it. If your enemy sees that your armor is impenetrable, and that you stand ready to defend at a moment's notice, then just it's almost likely that they will never come against you. They'd have to be stupid if they did. And, the, and, and my mind keeps going back to Genesis 3 where God put the flaming sword there at the, at the, uh, in a post there in the Garden of Eden to defend the way of the tree of life. And that sword stood every way and looked in every direction and guarded that tree well. And the idea was you'd have to be stupid to cross the line where that sword was to try to get at that tree. You'd have to be stupid. If you were going at that tree was the tree of life. And if you were going after that tree to get eternal life, you're going to lose your head and you're going to lose your life just in attempting it. And the idea was nobody went past that sword. Just the idea that it was well defended was defense enough. Does that make sense to everybody? If I've got, if I've got this armor on me and I'm carrying AR-15 on each shoulder and that pistol's right here and I'm walking around with my wife, you're not going to touch my wife. You're not going to do it. Because I'll pull a grenade out, drop it down your shorts and walk away. Amen. And you know that and you're not going to come in. That's the, that's the whole point. Is that a city well defended would never have to use the weapons that they have. And that's our point. But he didn't understand that. So I didn't argue with him. Didn't, didn't want to get into it with him. Didn't want to fight with the man. Uh, he said he loved me and I love him back. But people are going to accuse you of things you didn't do, you're not guilty of. You ought to tell God thank you. That they didn't accuse you of things you are guilty of. So verse 17, for it is better if the will of God be so that you suffer for well-doing than for evil-doing. Now verse 18. For Christ also hath once suffered for sins. How many times did he do it? Once. The Roman Catholic Church is wrong at, at their very core of what of their belief system their belief system is is that they must crucify christ afresh every time they have a mass performed so how many times is a catholic mass performed daily around the world thousands thousands of times every day the catholic church re-crucifies christ afresh and the bible says that's wrong christ suffered once for sins. And then it says the just for the unjust that he might bring us to God being put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the spirit. I can't remember, but if I remember right, two weeks ago, I gave you the idea that if your suffering, if you knew that your suffering in life would turn out to be a benefit as far as someone in this world being saved by what you went through, would it be worth it? Better believe it would. Now, I'm not talking about you suffering for you. I'm talking about you suffering for the sake of someone else being saved. Would it be worth it? Absolutely. We would, 
we would give our lives. If God asked us to, we would give and yield our lives over for the people that we love, that we want to see saved, if in doing so, they would respond in salvation and wouldn't complain that we're suffering for something we didn't do wrong. We wouldn't complain about it. We would be thankful that God was using us to suffer for the benefit of someone else's salvation. That's the two laws that we're given, the two commandments that we're given by Christ. Love the Lord your God and love your neighbor as yourself. And in that, he said, hangs all the law on the prophet. He said, if you love the Lord your God and you love your neighbor as yourself, you don't mind suffering for them, for their salvation, because you would want them to suffer for your salvation. That makes sense. You want to be saved, right? You don't want to die and go to hell, do you? Love your neighbor the same way. Love your friends. Even love your enemies that same way. And with that, the, the man that wrote me the email, he said, I think you ought to love your enemies and not shoot them. I think he misunderstands. I don't want to shoot my enemies. What I care about is defending my family, my property, my church, my country. I don't want to have to shoot my enemies. I love my enemies. I would, I would want my enemies to become saved so I don't have to shoot them. That's what I, that's what I care about. But anyway, that's what he's saying. Uh, and then he said, uh, being put to death in the flesh but quickened by the Spirit. And he, he mentions by the Spirit because that segues into verse 19. Being quickened by the Spirit, being made alive again by the Spirit. Verse 19, by which, meaning the Spirit, also, he went and preached unto the spirits in prison. What does that mean? What does it mean that Christ, by the Spirit, went to preach to spirits in prison? If you look in verse 20, uh, which sometime were disobedient, when once the long-suffering of God waited in the days of Noah while the ark was a preparing, wherein few, that is, eight souls, were saved by water. Now, eventually, I'm telling you, eventually, we're going to get, when we get to the end of verse 20, which is going to be a little while, but when we get to the end of verse 20, I'm going to cut off and we're going to do a deal on baptism. And what is water baptism and what is Holy Ghost baptism and wherein lies the difference? Because that is the mistake that groups like your Churches of Christ and the Roman Catholic Church and I guess others who would say, if you're not water baptized, you're not saved. That is not biblical. It's not what the Bible teaches. So what we're going to do is we're going to spend a little time dealing with the issue of baptism. What does the Bible say? What does the Bible mean? And so, and how we differentiate between water baptism and Holy Ghost baptism. This is just kind of letting you know where we're going. But he mentions... Spirits that were in prison that at one time were disobedient during the days of Noah uh, while the ark was preparing. So in the time between, let's say, Genesis chapter 3 and, and through the end of Genesis chapter 6 into Genesis chapter 7, we have a period of time where mankind became wildly disobedient. There were some that were righteous during that time, but most were disobedient. What happened to them when they died, or let's say what happened to those who perished in the flood? What happened to their souls? If you look at 1 Peter chapter 4, you turn your Bible there, he mentions the, there's another witness here, same book, but Christ also being talked about preaching to people, the gospel, he's preaching the gospel to the dead. I know the feeling sometimes. First Peter 4, 6. For this cause was the gospel preached also to them that are dead, that they might be judged according to men in the flesh, but live according to God in the spirit. But the end of all things at hand, there be ye therefore sober and watch unto prayer. What does that mean? He's preaching to them that are dead, but they're dead. 
Can they hear him? Can they listen to him? What does that mean? He's preaching under the spirits in prison. What does that mean? Let's go to Matthew chapter 12. And let's let the Bible explain the Bible. Um, the rundown is that when Christ, when his body died on the cross, his soul departed to the lower parts of the earth. And for three days, he preached to dead people, to spirits. Why was he doing that? Then on the third day, his soul, life comes back into his body again. He's resurrected. And then he preaches and, and people, hundreds of people see him. Then he ascends up into heaven. So the idea is that during that three days, and I can even remember as a child hearing this question discussed amongst the adults in our church. And it's not a fight. They were just, people were asking the question, what did Jesus do after his death on the cross where did he go? Where, where did his soul go? And so on. And I can remember hearing as a child, this always fascinated me, how Christ went and he preached to those that were dead for three days. He went to hell and he preached. And then on the third day, he rose again. Well, I read an article by uh, a man that I, I knew. I did not sit in any of his classes, but he was the dean of theology at one of the Bible colleges I went to, the esteemed Dr. So-and-so. And he said in this article that he used to believe that Christ went and preached the spirits in prison in, the, in their lower parts of the earth. But he's now re-examined the original Greek. And he no longer believes that. And I don't remember, it made me so upset I don't remember how he twisted and rested the scriptures to where he, I don't know what he's thinking, but now that he's read the original Greek, he no longer accepts that, no longer believes that, no longer teaches that. He's wrong. You don't need the Greek to tell you. And what, basically what he's saying is, you read it in your Bible, but your Bible's wrong. I have this new understanding and you're only going to get it from me because you'd never read it in the Bible because you don't know Greek. That's what these people are like. That's what they say. This is how they think. And I want you to be free from that. If you're not already, I want you to be free from that. If you read it in the Bible, you can believe it. Because that's how God said it. Amen? So Matthew chapter 12, verse 40. For as Jonas, we know who Jonah was, right? As Jonas was three days and three nights in the whale's belly... That'll clear that up too, because some people say, well, the Bible didn't say it was a whale. Yeah, it, Jesus said it was a whale. Okay, in Jonah, in the book of Jonah, the Bible says the Lord prepared a great fish. And, um, but Jesus said it was a whale, so that's what we believe. Three days and three nights in the whale's belly, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. And what we understand, that phrase heart, meaning the center of the earth, the very lowest depths if you picture the the globe of the earth it's not flat picture the globe of the earth and at the core of the earth is where the heart of the earth is and jesus said that the son of man would be three days and three nights in that location we know that it wasn't his body. His body was in the tomb. So it was his soul that spent those. Th now, another misunderstanding is you, your people like Kenneth Copeland and Benny Hinn and Joyce Myers, they believe this, that Jesus went and was writhing in agony in hell for three days and three nights, suffering hell for us. Where is that? That's not there. That's unbiblical. It's not biblical. That's what unbiblical means. That's not what the Bible, the Bible does not tell you anywhere that Christ went and suffered burning in hell for three days and three nights so that he could pay off 
our sins, and, and, but that, that is not what the Bible says. The Bible says he's went to the, heart, the lower part of the earth, the heart of the earth. And then, of course, that's what we're getting to in 1 Peter 3 and 1 Peter 4 was that he was preaching there, not writhing in agony. Not some emaciated worm that was burning and screaming in agony. That's not Christ. Okay? He wasn't there to suffer hell. He was there to preach. So, verse 41. The men of Nineveh shall rise in judgment with this generation and shall condemn it because they repented at the preaching of Jonas and behold, a greater than Jonas is here. Oh, amen to that, right? So, go to uh, Isaiah 61. Isaiah 61. Think of the lower part of the earth, the heart of the earth, as prison. And who's there? Who's, who's in that prison when Christ goes to preach there? Well, and we, I'm kind of doubling over some things that we talked about in our study on hell is that in, I don't, I don't think I even have this in my notes for tonight. Um, we'll go to Luke 16 here in a little bit to get the, to get the, the picture of what we're supposed to see here. But Isaiah 61, remember Jesus, when he took the book out of the hand of the, of the rabbi in the synagogue, he opened up to this passage, and this is where he read. Isaiah 61, 1, The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me, because the Lord hath anointed me to preach good tidings unto the meek. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and the opening of the prison to them that are bound. So the ministry of Christ is that he's died on the cross and now he is in the lower parts of the earth, the heart of the earth, and he's there to proclaim liberty to those captives that are there and to open the prison to them that are bound in the heart of the earth's prison. He's there to set them free. By the way, there is another teaching out there that says that Jesus went to hell to get the keys of hell from Satan. That also is not in your Bible. Satan doesn't have them. Jesus, is, Otis doesn't have them either, amen. Some of you watched Andy Griffin, you know what I'm talking about. Jesus is standing up in heaven right now with the keys. When did he get him? He's always had him. He's always had him. He never went to hell to get the keys from the devil. That's stupid. Why do people, I don't know why, I don't know where this stuff comes from. But anyway, uh, Zechariah 9, verse 11. I'll give you 12 seconds to turn there. As for thee also, by the blood of thy covenant, I have sent forth thy prison. Look at that. Look at Zechariah. You've got to turn Zechariah 9, 11. As for thee also, by the blood of thy covenant, I have sent forth thy prisoners out of the pit wherein is no water. Do you remember what the rich man wanted? Water. He's in the pit where there is no water. Okay? I'm smiling because... There's a passage of scripture, I just remembered, the story of Joseph. When Joseph was betrayed by his brethren, do you know where they put him? In a pit wherein was no water. The Bible specifically mentions it was a pit wherein was no water. Hell. That's a picture of hell, the lower part of the earth. There's no water there. So... Verse 12, Zechariah 9, 12, Turn you to the stronghold, ye prisoners of what? Look at that word, hope. Even today do I declare that I will render double unto thee. Double always means New Testament, second coming, things like that, all right? But Zechariah 9, he said, By the blood of thy covenant have I sent forth thy prisoners out of the pit wherein is no water. So it's by Christ's blood and the new covenant 
that he's able to go to the lower parts of the earth and he's preaching to spirits that are in prison, the prisoners of hope. And he's able to tell them, you're set free as of today. You're free. I'm going to let you out. So if we go to uh, Luke chapter 16, you know what? I do have that in my notes. Huh, I'm smarter than I thought I was. Luke 16, verse 19. There was a certain rich man which was clothed in purple and fine linen, fared sumptuously every day. There was a certain beggar named Lazarus, which was laid at his gate full of sores, desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, the dogs came... I always wanted to name a dog moreover. You know, moreover, the dog. By the way, I got that joke from Tim and Al. Tim Barron's is coming here in about a week and a half and he's asked if I can let him preach here and I'm going to let him if you've never met Tim Barron's he's six foot 18 inches tall and he he's he's the guy who used to be on radio here in St. Louis and he lives in lost wages and hands out gospel tracts 300 a day every day so he called me today and said he's coming into town for a week and want to know if he could come speak and I said let me let me figure you in all right so I'm looking forward to it you'll love this guy uh, but anyway, that was his joke, moreover the dog. Come here, moreover. Moreover the dogs came and licked his sores. And it came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by the angels in Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried, and in hell he lift up his eyes, being in torment, seeth Abraham far off. So we get this picture here. The, this is the lower parts of the earth. This is the heart of the earth. And... Just as in your physical heart, there's a separation, there's a wall of separation in your heart. There is a gulf of separation between those who are in torment, and those who are in comfort. Abraham and Lazarus, David is here, King David, King Solomon is here, Jehoshaphat's here, um, Ruth is here. Esther's here, okay? We have, we have all these wonderful, faithful people here in Abraham's bosom. They are in this place, even though they are in somewhat comfort, they are in prison. They're held there. And Jesus comes after the cross to preach the gospel to them, to tell them that by his blood, they're going to be set free. And he sets the, the, I guess that very day he sets them free because he told the thief on the cross, this day wilt thou be with me in paradise. And so Christ then goes to the heart of the earth and he's preaching to those in Abraham's bosom, he's preaching to them, you're going to be taken out of here. Um, verse 24, and he cried, Father Abraham, have mercy on me. Send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I'm tormented in this flame. Lazarus is not tormented in any flame. The rich man is. So there's a difference in the places. But they're both in the heart of the earth. Abraham said, Son, remember that thou in thy lifetime receivest thy good things, and likewise Lazarus evil things, but now he is comforted, and thou art tormented. Beside all this, between us and you there is a great gulf fixed, so that they which would pass from hence to you cannot, neither can they pass to us that would come from thence. That rich man, think about it, He's been there now in agony for 2,000 years. That's a long time. The only time he's going to be let out is for the moment that he will be judged by God and then cast into the lake of fire forever and forever 
and forever. So, Jesus is preaching to spirits. On the one hand, those in Abraham's bosom, he's saying, I died on the cross. My blood has now atoned for your transgressions. You accepted me by faith before you knew it was me. I love that. I love it. Everybody that followed, and, and why is it Abraham's bosom? Because they are of the faith of Abraham. Those who followed God by faith, even in the Old Testament, they follow God by faith. They are the seed of Abraham, and they have the faith of Abraham, and they're in Abraham's bosom, and even though they're comforted, they're still not where they want to be. It's like being here. Even if you have good days where things are okay, this is still not where I want to end up. I have a better place. Amen? So, uh, then on the other side, we have uh, uh, the rich man. He's in torment. Uh, who else is there? Name somebody in the Old Testament that you're pretty sure he's with the rich man. Saul? Nabal? Huh? Who? Ahab? Jezebel? Who else? Name some wicked people out of the Old Testament. Huh? Cain? Yeah. Cain was of that wicked one. Okay? What Cain was doing was not by faith, apparently, because Abel... Sacrifice was by faith, okay? So all these people that died before Christ, died in their sins, they're in hell, and they're suffering, they're in torments. We have a picture of that. Turn your Bible to Genesis 40. Genesis 40. I'll never forget. I, God showed me this, and I thought, God, that is the coolest thing in the whole world until the next thing that God showed me. Then I said, God, that then is the coolest thing in the whole world. But this is right up there. Genesis 40. You have a number. 40. Okay? Represents the spiritual realm or the, the other dimension. And in this case, we have a picture then of Christ. Joseph is playing the part of Jesus. Remember, for every doctrine... There's a picture. God drew a picture of it. So you have a picture of Christ preaching to spirits in prison. Genesis 40. And it came to pass after these things that the butler of the king of Egypt and his baker had offended their lord, the king of Egypt. And Pharaoh was wroth against two of his officers, against the chief of the butlers and against the chief of the bakers. And he put them in ward in the house of the captain of the guard into the prison. There's your key right there, the prison. And uh, the place where Joseph was bound. Why was Joseph there? Wrongfully accused. Just like Jesus. He was in a place that he didn't deserve to be in because he didn't do anything wrong. So, uh, verse 4, And the captain of the guard charged Joseph with them, and, and, and he served them, and they continued a season in ward. And they dreamed a dream, both of them, each man his dream in one night, each man according to the interpretation of his dream, the butler and the baker of the king of Egypt, which were bound in the prison. Verse 6, And Joseph came in unto them in the morning, looked upon them, and behold, they were sad. And he asked Pharaoh's officers that were with him in the word of his Lord's house, saying, Wherefore look ye so sadly today? They could have said, We're in prison! Why wouldn't we be sad? That's not what they said. And they said unto him, We have dreamed a dream, and there is no interpreter of it. And Joseph said unto them, Do not interpretations belong to God. Tell me them, I pray you. Joseph is now going to be in the place of God. All right? So, the chief butler told his dream to Joseph and said to him, In my dream, behold, a vine was before me. Think about the symbolism now that you're looking at. A vine. 
Who is the vine? It's Christ. I am the true vine. All right? So, vine was before me. And in the vine were three branches. In Christ dwelt the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Father, Son, Holy Ghost. And it was, though, and it was as though it budded, and her blossom shot forth, and the clusters thereof brought forth ripe grapes. And Pharaoh's cup was in my hand. I took the grapes, pressed them into Pharaoh's cup. Notice that he did not put any leaven in that wine. New wine comes from the cluster, the Bible says. And I gave the cup into Pharaoh's hand. And Joseph said unto him, this is the interpretation of it. The three branches are three days. Yet with it, see that three days? How long was Jesus in the heart of the earth? Three days. So he said, yet within three days shall Pharaoh lift up thine head and restore thee unto thy place, and thou shalt deliver Pharaoh's cup into his hand after the former manner when thou wast his butler. But think on me when it shall be well with thee and show kindness, I pray thee, unto me. In other words, here's my payment for giving you the interpretation of your dream. When you get out, mention my name. Uh, verse 15, for indeed I was stolen away out of the land of Hebrews and here also have I done nothing that they should put me into the dungeon. So now look, verse 16. And the chief baker saw that the interpretation was good. He said unto Joseph, I also was in my dream and behold, I had three white baskets on my head. And in the uppermost basket, there was all manner of bake meats for Pharaoh. And the birds did eat them out of the basket upon my head. Birds. Think of birds. What are they a symbol of? Th spirits. Think of when the seed is sown, the fowls of the air came and devoured it up. Jesus gave the interpretation. Satan cometh immediately, devoureth the word. So the bread, you could say, represents the word of God, but it's devoured off from this guy's head. It's gone. Uh, so verse 20, and it came to pass the third day, which was, um, well, let's see, I missed part of it. I've skipped something here. Verse 18, Joseph answered and said, this is the interpretation there of the three baskets are three days. Yet within three days shall Pharaoh lift up thy head from off thee. <laughs> uh oh. And shall hang thee on a tree. And the birds shall eat thy flesh from off thee. It came to pass the third day, which was Pharaoh's birthday, that he made a feast unto all his servants, and he lifted up the head of the chief butler of the chief baker, and the chief baker among his servants. And he restored the chief butler unto his butlership again, and he gave the cup unto Pharaoh's hand. But he hanged the chief baker as Joseph had interpreted to them. So now you see the picture of preaching to spirits in prison. On the one side... He's preaching being, them being set free and going into the paradise of God in heaven. Third day. Then on the other hand, those who lived not by faith, they're going to wait. And then when they are lifted out, cursed be anyone who hangeth from a tree, the Bible says. These guys are cursed. Their curse has not been lifted from them. So now they're going to perish in the lake of fire that burns forever and forever because they're cursed. So now you see that without us having actual video of Christ and what he was doing, we have something better than that. We have a picture of that very thing in our Bibles drawn out for us, knowing then what Christ did. He took those that were captive, bound in prison, and he set them free. But then there's spirits in prison. And, and I asked who was there. We mentioned Saul. We mentioned Nabal, Ahab, Jezebel. Somebody else, I think, is there too. In that prison. Okay? And I'll tell you who it is next week. But there's a story that shows that when they chose, when Israel was given a choice at Christ's crucifixion, 
The other guy that they chose was who? Barabbas. Where did they get him from? Prison. Dun, dun, dun. Guess who Barabbas is a picture of? Because mankind is going to be offered a choice here before too long. The real Jesus or another Jesus. The real Jesus is coming down from heaven. The other Jesus is going to be brought up out of prison. Okay? We'll maybe talk about that next Wednesday. All right?